All right, some of you came in today. Uh, one of you actually asked me, what is the coldest we've ever experienced in actual temperature? And the best of my recollection is 33 below. Wind chill. Wind chill of 70 below was the coldest I've, I've ever uh, experienced. In fact, I've gone skiing when it was 20 below. Uh, however, folks, I am willing to admit that this is cold even by Midwestern standards. It's uh, a chill. I still have not taken out my winter clothes yet, but I put, I put my three season jacket on this morning. So, uh, and my gloves. So I did get to that point. Um, it, it's one of those things where you, you just, I like it. I like walking out and that little brisk slap in the face. Uh, I find it really exhilarating, actually. Um, and I am one of those rare people that when it snows, I really like uh, shoveling or snow blowing and having the snow come flying back in your face. And it's like, <coughs> I. I enjoy that and especially having somebody like Esther alongside and we're out there shoveling away or, or whatever yeah <clears throat> but I did something this morning I have never done partially because when I was younger we didn't have access to it but the tan car that we own has uh, seat warmers and I got in this morning and uh, you know it's it's cold and and I start the car and everything works fine and I saw that little button and I thought do I push it or not I went ahead and pushed the button and after a couple minutes I started feeling you know the seat getting a little warm and cozy and about halfway to church it's feeling really pretty nice you know and then I by the time I get to church I'm ready to turn that baby off <laughs> it's not supposed to be that warm back there and uh, so I got the, you know turned off the car and came in it didn't take long because the furnaces weren't working when I thought maybe I should go back out to the car with the seat warmers but I was thinking on the way here how many things we have in our lives that give us the flawed sense of security of warmth when really it's not I could push that button and my backside would feel warm and there's something about your body that's like oh okay that's warm so I'm okay it was still five degrees you know I would still freeze but that little bit of warmth gives you the idea that you're okay we have things in our lives that lull us into complacency we, we think we're okay you look around and there are people who are worse than you who are acting worse than you and we fall into this idea that I'm not that bad or I haven't committed that sin I haven't I'm not guilty of those things and it's like pushing the button on the seat warmer I'm okay and you don't realize you're still pretty dirty you're sin sick we have people in the world who don't know Jesus but they have seat warmers in their lives you know what I mean and they think they're okay but they're going to hell they're gonna find a really warm you know they're gonna be really warm one day but we Christians do it too we just are better at the game we think we're okay we fooled ourselves into thinking if my backside is warm I'm okay and that's not the case it's not the case we have this time of confession at the beginning of our services because we have to admit to ourselves and we have to admit to God that it's only a seat warmer all we're doing is we've kind of gotten ourselves to a place of comfort but not really cleansing and there's a difference we have to be careful that we're not confusing comfort with being whole with being truly cleansed when we go to the Lord and we confess our sins we understand and we have to admit 
that a seat warmer isn't enough. We have to go to the cross. We have to be completely cleansed, completely whole. So I challenge you to do that today. Don't be satisfied with a seat warmer. Don't let it fool you. Don't let the things of this world fool you into thinking you're okay without the cross, without Jesus. So let's go to him now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you indeed. We thank you for the ability to come to you and be absolutely cleansed. But in the process, Lord, we have to admit that those things in life that fool us into thinking we're okay are not a complete healing. They're just a facade. And so we put those things away and we come to you now. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, your word has promised that when we come to you in brokenness, in repentance, confessing our sins, you indeed are faithful and just. You forgive us our sins and you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we thank you for that amazing, amazing mercy. Lord, may we not be fooled into thinking we're okay. May we run to you. May we run to the cross moment by moment, day by day, and know for sure that we are cleansed. We thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. The Old Testament lesson is found in the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy, beginning at the 15th verse. That's at page 204 in your pew Bible. Uh, this is Moses addressing the people of Israel. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. To him you shall listen. This is in accordance with everything that you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Do not let me hear the voice of the Lord my God again, and do not let me see this great fire any more, or I will die. And the Lord said to me, They have spoken well. I will raise up for them a prophet from among their countrymen, like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak them to them, everything that I command him. And it shall come about that whoever does not listen to my words, which he speaks in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, a word which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how will we recognize the word which the Lord has not spoken? When the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, and the thing does not happen or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You are not to be afraid of him. Here ends the Old Testament reading. The epistle lesson comes from the 12th chapter of Romans, beginning at the 6th verse, and that's found at page 1136 of your pew Bible. However, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to use them properly. If prophecy, in proportion to one's faith. If service, in the act of serving or the one who teaches in the act of teaching, or the one who exhorts in the work of exhortation, the one who gives with generosity, the one who is in leadership with diligence, the one who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Love must be free of hypocrisy, detest what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. 
be of the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Here ends the reading. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Just a quick footnote, that Old Testament reading sounds like, oh, well, that they needed that back then because God spoke through prophets back then, things like that. We don't really need that today. Uh, is that true? No, there are a lot of false prophets out there. There are a lot of people who claim to be speaking for God. And the same rules apply. It, it doesn't change. Uh, if they are speaking for themselves, their own agendas, um, or another God, it will tell in the fruit. Uh, you can measure the accuracy of their word. That's why we need to stick to God's word. We need to stick to what he is saying, because we know that will always be true. But speculation um, and here saying there are lots of prophets out there who would like you to think, oh, well, nobody's perfect. Wait a minute. Scripture is pretty clear. If you're from God, you will be as far as your accuracy goes. Uh, John chapter 2 is where we're going to jump in, <coughs> excuse me, with our gospel lesson for today. We're going to read the first 11 verses. Actually, I'm going to go through verse 12 uh, to conclude. And if you're following along in your pew Bible, it's page uh, 1059 in your pew Bible. And I'm going to ask you to rise as I read this this morning. John 2, beginning at verse 1. <coughs> On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with me, or with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. And after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his br uh, mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. Here ends our gospel lesson for today. Let's join together as we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, as you'll find on the screen in front of you or in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, saints. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John, for being willing to fill in again. <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank and praise you that we have the privilege of being called your children. We thank you for the opportunities that you give us here in this life, and so many of them just pass by looking so ordinary. And yet, you desire to blend in the miraculous in the midst of those ordinary situations. 
We ask, Lord, that as we look at a couple of segments of your word, that we would have eyes to see the miraculous in the midst of the ordinary and to see how extraordinary our God really can be. Challenge us, Lord. Empower us, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. I couldn't help think uh, yesterday I watched uh, Pilgrim's Progress, the recent uh, uh, animated version that uh, came out. And singing that last song, I found myself walking through uh, in my head thinking about the Pilgrim's Progress, the story of that. Um, it's amazing how God kind of brings things back to your, your mind. Try to put yourself in the shoes of the disciples for just a moment. <clears throat> You have walked with Jesus for three years. Uh, you have watched as he has ministered. You have encountered the miraculous. You have seen him touch one life after another. You've seen him uh, take loaves of bread and fish and, and feed thousands of people at a couple of different times. Uh, you've seen him heal and restore and now all of a sudden, the one that you've walked with, the one you have witnessed at the, you know, in the midst of those miracles, he's gone. What is your life like? What do you do now? You know you can't do those things. At least you don't realize you can. You have put your entire faith and your entire uh, energy, your commitment into following this man. And he's proven himself to be faithful and powerful and wise. And now he's gone. At least that's how it feels. That's how it was for the disciples. The time had come for Jesus to die. I know we've just come through Christmas. But he came to die. We, we can't forget that. So the disciples are there and uh, feeling like the burden of the whole world is now on their shoulders. And in a way, it was. This ragtag group was now going to be the foundation of the new church. Do you feel up to the task? You're one of the eleven. And you realize in that moment that now all of the future is up to you. Or at least that's how it appears. Peter was struggled. The rest of the disciples struggled. But we'll look at Peter for just a second. We've discussed in the past how Peter's brash, cocky persona faded dramatically after his humiliating experience denying Christ. He's put on the spot. You would think that after all this time, a little bit of pressure, a little bit of pushback would be no big deal for a guy like Peter. And yet, three times we're told that he denies Jesus. And it's not because his life is threatened. It's because a little pushback has come. No, I don't know him. I don't know the... I, and he curses. I tell you, I don't know the man. And the cock crows, and the blood must have just run from his head. He must, can you imagine in that moment? So his life now had been, he had to confront the reality of his own failure in the midst of a little bit of challenge. The scriptures speak of a number of visitations. Peter wasn't the only one who struggled. Thomas struggled, if you remember. I'm not going to go into the details of all that, but unless I see with my eyes, unless I touch with my hands, not I struggle to believe. He said, I will not believe. The disciples had come to a point of utter confusion and loss of focus. They had become a band of bewildered brothers, lost sheep with no direction now that their shepherd was gone, or at least he was absent. We see in John chapter 21, as we get to the end of the story, that they're together. You would think that fellowship would bring out the best in them, but instead fellowship led to further disarray when Peter makes the amazing st statement, you know what, I think I'm going to go fishing. 
Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana. The sons of Zebedee and two others of the disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. And they went out and got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. Now why in the world would Peter make such an asinine statement? They're together, Jesus has died, and Peter goes, <laughs> I'm going fishing. Why? It's what he knew. We fall back on our routine. When we don't know what to do, you do what you're comfortable doing. If I wasn't a pastor, if for some reason something happened and I couldn't be a pastor anymore, I'd be a restaurant manager. It's what I know. You have things that you did previously, and maybe God has you someplace else. You're doing something else. And then what if that door closed? What would you do? Probably fall back on what you know. Is that necessarily wrong? No, you do what you're comfortable doing. The problem here is that the door hadn't really shut. It was... A lack of focus it was a lack of energy it was a lack of this brash person now you know is is responsible to move forward he now is going to be the leader you know he's always been the mouthpiece of the group and he doesn't know what to do so he goes back to what he knows now we're not told that he's going to do this indefinitely that he's chucking everything obviously not but he's got to do something so he falls back on the comfortable their exciting life with Jesus was gone. Three years of teaching and miracles were over. You get the idea that following Jesus' resurrection, the disciples' lives had disintegrated into simply going through the motions of their daily routines. Life had once again become very ordinary. The excitement of being with Jesus was done. He's, he's gone. And so you just kind of go through the motions. You don't know what else to do. And so they, they just kind of ran into routine. Has your faith ever become just routine? Do you ever find yourself kind of in that void and you're just going through the motions because you've lost your vision, you've lost your passion? Maybe you've gotten your eyes off Jesus and you don't know where to go? Well, the disciples were kind of like that. Finally, Peter, the least likely to take boredom sitting down, decides he's going to fall back on what he knows best. He's going to go fishing. But sadly, the ordinary had also failed to bring satisfaction. Compared to life with Jesus, even Peter's earlier livelihood failed to be productive. We're told in that last phrase, they went out and got into the boat, and that other phrase, the phrase just following, and that night they caught. This is a seasoned fisherman. He knows what to do. He knows how to fish. Nobody has to tell him what to do, what to look for, where to go. It had only been three years. And who knows how many times he'd been fishing in the meantime. But they all followed him. They went out in the boat and they caught nothing. Now for someone who is a trained fisherman, multi-generational occupation, and you go out there, there aren't too many more embarrassing things than to come home empty-handed. And they, they were. They were in the boat and they had caught nothing until Jesus shows up. Verse 4, But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you, have not, or you do not have any fish, do you? And they had to fess up. Oh no, we got a bunch in the boat here. You know, the average person would not know. The average person would call out there that he was far enough away they couldn't recognize him, or they didn't recognize him. After all, in their heads, he died, remember? So a guy calls out from the shore, you don't have any fish, do you? <laughs> sure, we have so many fish. But they were honest. 
they understood there was something that motivated them to fess up he knew and I, I think they understood though they may not have recognized it was Jesus they couldn't bluff him so Jesus continues they answered him no he said to them cast the net on the right hand side of the boat and you will find a catch so they cast and they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish isn't it astounding that in the midst of their failure Jesus shows up he didn't show up before they got in their boats but after the disciples had tasted the bitter taste of weariness and failure why do you think that would happen they were out there all night caught nothing jesus shows up on the shore and says cast your net on the other side why didn't he come earlier when they had all kinds of energy because there would be no miracle in that oftentimes jesus waits until we are exhausted until we've done our own long enough to the point where we are absolutely you know done we're spent and then Jesus shows up and oftentimes his remedy is very simple but see the difference is doing it with Jesus or doing it without Jesus we exhaust ourselves to the point of weariness doing it without Jesus and then Jesus shows up sometimes giving us very ordinary instructions but we do it with him and that makes all the difference Then, after Jesus gave his directions, there were no questions asked. The disciples just switched sides. They didn't know it was Jesus exactly. We're told that they did not recognize that it was him, but yet they obeyed him. Apparently, Peter, the cocky, stiff-necked fisherman we saw in Luke chapter 5, had learned the importance of being teachable and obedient, even in the midst of a familiar, ordinary circumstance, he obeyed. The outcome was an astounding catch of fish. But you see, these disciples had learned long ago that hidden behind the ordinary was an extraordinary master. It took them a long time to understand that lesson. It took them a while to be able to grasp the fact that oftentimes when Jesus is in the midst of a circumstance, what appears to be ordinary is anything but and one of the circumstances the first one really is the one we read about in John chapter 2 a very ordinary circumstance a very ordinary situation an event where nobody expected a miraculous encounter but yet Jesus was there and the ordinary became Extraordinary. So the rest of the time that we're going to spend is looking actually back at something that was a lesson for them that led them to what we see happen in John chapter 21. So I'm going to invite you to go back to John chapter 2 mentally to think back to that time when Jesus works his very first miracle. We turn back the calendar about three years. We shift scenes to a small community on the southwest side of the Sea of Galilee. Cana is a city northwest and not far from where Jesus grew up in Nazareth. If you were going to look at a map, you'd have the Sea of Galilee up there, you'd have Nazareth kind of down here, and then you'd have Cana kind of in the middle. All right? So southwest of the Sea of Galilee, but northwest of where he grew up. But it wouldn't have been real far from the area where he spent most of his youth. Okay? <clears throat> The time was not long after Jesus had called his disciples. The occasion is a wedding feast, with Jesus, his disciples, and even Jesus' mother, Mary, all being invited. This was not an unusual thing. This was not some high and holy event like the Passover or something like that. It was just a family wedding. And Jesus and Mary, the disciples, they were involved. They were included. Uh, some have, have uh, mentioned that maybe Mary was part of the planning of this. As a family member, uh, may have been involved in getting everything together. Uh, 
why else would she be pointed out? You know, well, there are other reasons too, but some of those, some of that speculation is there, that this may have been a family event. There was nothing really unusual about this week-long event. It was a wedding like any ordinary wedding in Cana at the time. The guests were present, the food was plentiful, and the wine was flowing. That is, until about midweek. We're told the third day. All right? Now, uh, again, you have to understand that these things weren't a, a one-hour thing, a little fellowship time afterwards like we've gotten used to. This was a time to get together, a time to fellowship, a time for the bride and the groom to celebrate with family and friends and, and all of that. So the feast often ran for six, seven days. All right? And you had to have, imagine if you're the host or hostess in this situation, you had to have food and wine and entertainment, you know, everything to, to keep the family going to keep the, the spirits high through this whole thing. That's one reason why the, the uh, guy says, you know, most people serve the good wine first and the bad wine second, or the, you know, kind of the leftovers, because it's the first couple of days that everybody's eating and toasting and everything else, and you want to put your best foot forward. Uh, by the way, they're probably, you know, had a few glasses of wine by the third day, and you're not going to tell. <clears throat> but I'm getting ahead of myself. Suddenly the wine stopped flowing and this ordinary feast was soon to become a public embarrassment. We jump in at verse 1. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, it wasn't just running down. I have a little message on the printer ink is low ink is very low i'm only printing in black because the color is gone you know i have these warnings available most of our technology has things like that battery is running low we're told in the story that the wine ran out about the third day now, if you are a host or hostess of this gathering, you are looking for some place to hide because you have really failed. Now, granted, you know, who knows how many showed up? Maybe there were more people. Yeah, you can speculate about a lot of stuff. Bottom line is you were, you'd run out. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. You do your best to prepare for every eventuality, and it never fails. Some unexpected problem arises. That's how it is in everyday life. Trouble invades even the most joyful and celebratory situations. But what's to worry? You're among friends, right? You know, I can't tell you the number of times when I have been a little nervous about Sunday morning or some event or something, and so I'm running around trying to fix things, and somebody, one of you wonderful, wonderfully gracious, hospitality-motivated people say, don't worry, Pastor, you're among friends. You know, I appreciate the sentiment, but I still have to deal with the embarrassment if something goes wrong. In this situation, you could almost hear somebody say, oh, that's okay, you're among friends. It is still an absolutely crushing embarrassment to run out of wine at a gathering that was supposed to go days longer. So Mary goes to Jesus and says, fix it. In every true mother's manner, to a capable offspring like Jesus, fix it. That's my paraphrase. But how did Jesus respond? What does running out of wine have to do with us? Us. How, how does running out of stuff have, what's that got to do with us? Sure.
surely Jesus would come out, come to the rescue, pull one of those rabbits out of his hat, so to speak. At least Jesus' mother, Mary, knew he could do something about the possible embarrassment to the host. So she attempts to step in and direct her son to action. But this was not Jesus' plan. You know, sometimes we feel the pressure. We back ourselves in the corners. We try to figure out a way out. And I'm guessing I'm not the only one who turns to God at that point and goes, you have a responsibility now to get me out of this. And I have to wonder what God thinks in the midst of that. Really? It's my responsibility to get you out of your problem? I am really glad that I don't serve a God who says, <laughs> forget it. I'm not concerned with your problem. I got my own concerns. You deal with it yourself. Now, there are times where he lets us fall on our face because how else do we learn? Okay? There are those times where he says, no, no, you need to feel this one. But it doesn't mean that he doesn't care. It doesn't mean that he isn't walking through that difficulty with us. And there are times in his mercy where he changes the circumstance and, yes, redeems. We're told that he turns all things together, works all things together for good. Those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. And in this moment, even though Mary might have been a little bit presumptuous, a little bit audacious, we see in this moment a really strong statement of faith. Because she turns and she says to the servants, not to Jesus, but she says to the servants, whatever he says to do, do it. Now that's pretty bold. He doesn't, she doesn't turn to Jesus and go, how dare you, son? Don't talk to me like that. You don't see any of that kind of attitude. There is a simple recognition, a humility. I know he can do something. Servants, whatever he says, do it. Now, it's interesting because remember in the Garden of, uh, Garden of Eden, Gethsemane, where Jesus is praying, and he says to the Father, you know what, is there a plan B in your pocket here somewhere? Can we do something else than what's coming in the next couple of days? But he ends it, not my will, but yours be done. In a similar way, we see Mary with that kind of emulating that kind of attitude. At first she comes and goes, hey, they're running out of wine, do something. And Jesus kind of steps back and goes, oh, really? And you see this kind of shift in her attitude, looking to the servants, whatever he says to do, do it. Whatever happens is going to be for the best. So do whatever he says. There's a sense of humility and obedience in that. I will take whatever you give me, Jesus, because I can trust you. I know that whatever you're going to do is going to be the best in this situation. So rather than command you what to do, I will take whatever you choose for this moment. She had absolute confidence in her son. No matter what he decided to do, it would be the right thing to do. One simple instruction is all she gives. Whatever he says to do, do it. Nothing profound, but yet extremely challenging and absolutely humbling. Don't ask questions. Don't challenge the principle involved. And don't debate tactics. Just do it. Reminds me of Naaman. Do you remember Naaman in the Old Testament? Had leprosy. And the prophet told him to go dip himself seven times in the Jordan. And he goes, I got better, I got better rivers where I came from. Why would I want to go dip myself in the Jordan? And it took his servant to say, you know what, if he'd have asked you to do something tough, you'd have done it. He asked you to do something simple. So why not do it? You remember the rest of the story? Did Naaman go back to one of his own rivers? No, he did what the prophet told him to do. And the outcome was 
he was healed. He was told to do something simple, but it took his humility to act on it, and the blessing came. You see the same thing with the wedding. Mary didn't say, you know, some outlandish thing, whatever he says to do it. If it's ordinary, if it's simple, do it anyway. This is all going to work out. But you have to humble yourself to whatever the command is. The difficulty of simple instructions, especially when we might have a better plan in mind. Lose an axe head in a river lately? Just toss in a stick. Makes sense, right? Only if you know the story from Scripture. Otherwise, that's a stupid thing to do. Need a massive army conquered? Have 300 men attack carrying torches and blowing trumpets. Great answer, right? Any military leader would laugh you off the stage unless you knew the story. Need to bring an army's wall crashing down? Simply have your people walk around the town seven days and then yell really loud and blow horns. That'll do it, right? I was watching a video the other day uh, of different situations where demolition experts were supposed to bring buildings down, you know, and different things. And they, you know, they've got all the degrees that say that they know what they're doing. And so they put the explosives around and, you know, all kinds of stuff they planned. And it tips or it falls the wrong way. You know, when we do things the way we think they should be done, so often they don't work out well. Unless Jesus is in it and you sometimes follow simple instructions. Need a world saved from their sins? Send your only son into the world as a man to die and then rise again. As the old song says, what a strange way to save the world. We're going to continue on in John chapter 2. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification. Do you know what that means? When you would come in, there's this process you would go through. You'd wash your hands, you'd wash your feet. Uh, there was this idea that when you came in to celebrate, you didn't just come in. You didn't have the audacity to come in dirty. And so there was sometimes a pot of water, a basin, a laver there to wash up a little bit. You, you came in clean and you should be wearing the right clothes. There's a whole parable about that that Jesus talks about. Wearing the right clothes that are often provided by the, uh, the master of the household. All right. So now you've got these pots and their purpose was every day common. Water there for the point, the purpose of purification for the guests. But they were pretty good sized pots. We're told 20, 30 gallons in each of these pots. So Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. Can you imagine being one of the servants? You know where that liquid came from. You just filled those stupid things. You bring them back and Jesus goes, give them to the head waiter. Give a goblet to the head waiter. Can you imagine what that must have been like? I'm not sure. I mean, I'd like to think that these servants said, you know what, Jesus can do anything and stand bold. Here, take. I'm not so sure. <clears throat> I have a feeling they probably came a little bit apprehensive. I just took this water from the well. I filled up the pot. And now this guy says I'm supposed to give it to the head waiter. As if water is going to suffice the rest of the week. I understand about the embarrassment of running out of wine. That's bad enough. And then to ask your guests to drink water the rest of the time. So I'm not sure I would have wanted to be one of those servants. Mary must have been standing there just watching. Anticipating what this was going to mean. So the servants do what they're told. When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine. And it's interesting, we don't know when that happened. 
Do, did that happen as they carried the jars? Did that happen uh, as they were, you know, ladling it out? Did it happen on the way? But somewhere between the well and the head waiter, water was now wine. Didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, when the head waiter uh, tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it had come from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first time we see the bridegroom mentioned. He's oblivious to all this. Mary knew about it. The servants understood. But the bridegroom had no clue what was happening. Okay, now you're the bridegroom, you're at the celebration of your wedding, and the head waiter comes and says, Wow, this is fantastic wine! What's your reaction going to be? <laughs> of course! Now the servants understood, and the bridegroom must have been shocked. The head waiter is absolutely stunned. This is completely backwards. But the disciples, can you imagine being one of the disciples watching all this happen? They'd just been called to follow Jesus. Six large ordinary jars are gathered and filled with water. Nothing special about the water, nothing special about the jars, only about the instructions. They gather the water as they had day after day for the practice of purification. No chanting, no incantations, nothing added to the water except for the obedience of the people acting out Jesus' instructions in faith. There are times in our lives where we want to add something. We're going to make it spiritual. When actually God says, my instruction is really simple, just do this and it becomes sacred because God's in the midst of it Jesus is in the midst of it suddenly the ordinary becomes extraordinary only because of the instructions and obedience to the instructions not because of anything we add not because of anything sanctimonious only the fact that we've obeyed a simple instruction Talk to your coworker. Pray for so and so. I want you to go to this shop. And you find out when you get there that the person is really struggling and needs some encouragement. Ordinary things. And obedience turns the ordinary extraordinary. An ordinary situation involving an ordinary problem where an extraordinary Savior uses ordinary means to fulfill an extraordinary salvation. There was nothing astonishing about anything in this story other than the fact that Jesus showed up and whatever he told them, they did. That was Mary's instruction. Turned to the servants and said, whatever he says to do, do it. How many times do we miss God's miraculous intervention in the ordinary times of our lives simply because we refuse to look silly or take those scary steps of obedience into the unknown? Just ask Elisha's servant or Gideon or Joshua how miraculous a simple ordinary act of obedience can be. Uh, if you didn't associate those names, they were with the miracles that I mentioned earlier. The axe head and the army being beaten and the wall coming down <clears throat> all involve those ordinary guys just obeying. And God then does the extraordinary. Ordinary situations with an extraordinary God. Exhausted fishermen needing a catch, Jesus shows up and says, try the other side. A wedding party with no wine, Jesus says to get some water and only leave room in the jars for God to work. We take simple water and it becomes a redemptive flood and baptism. We take ordinary bread and wine and communion and it becomes a spiritual cleansing and empowerment. Sometimes I get into conversations with people and they, they say, how can 
as you actually a quote from your catechism how can water do such great things how can bread and wine do such miraculous things this is the simple answer because we're told to that's all it takes for the ordinary to become extraordinary God says do it and I promise this is the outcome and so we do it we baptize not because the water is so special but because God's Word commands it and we're simply obeying trusting that he is going to do what he does best and that's transform the heart of stone into a heart of flesh why do we celebrate communion why do we take a simple piece of bread and wine because Jesus says I'm there I promise to be there the words that we use are in with and under the bread and the wine don't change into something they're still bread and wine but Jesus says I'm there the ordinary becomes extraordinary God is just waiting to take our ordinary lives and make them extraordinary and that's what happens when Jesus is invited to our parties let's pray dear Heavenly Father we are indeed amazed and touched when you show up and sometimes in the simplest of circumstances your word has promised that if we simply take what you say and obey the ordinary can become extraordinary Lord may we not try to evaluate everything from a materialistic perspective may we not try to add our own little bits to things and and say oh you know I need to be part of this may we simply as Mary did say God what is your instruction and I will do it knowing that you work all things together for good may that be our motivation in your name, amen.